Good morning. Happy Earth Day. Welcome to Dover Stone Church. My name is Sean Carroll, and I'm a resource educator for Cornell Cooperative Extension's Environment and Energy Program. Today we're celebrating Earth Day here at this beautiful preserve in the town of Dover. And I'm here with my colleague, Julie, who I'll introduce shortly. Uh, my role with Cooperative Extension as a resource educator is to educate uh, municipal officials, residents, and the youth of Dutchess County on a host of environmental topics ranging from natural resources to uh, energy conservation and a whole host of other things. We welcome you here today on this beautiful sunny day and take a nice walk with us through the, th on the trail today. Let's head on up the trail and I'll introduce you to my friend and colleague, Julie Hart. Thank you, Sean. My name is Julie Hart and I'm an ecologist with the Duchess Land Conservancy. We're a land trust. Our office is located in Millbrook, um, which is actually just right down the road from the Farm and Home Center where Flatford of Extension is. And as a land trust, our objective is to protect land. We work throughout Duchess County and into the surrounding areas and we work with landowners to protect their land for public benefit. So we are protecting forests and fields, farms and farmland soils, um, wetlands and waterways, and that includes the Stone Church, actually. This is a preserve that's owned by the town of Dover, and it's protected by conservation easements that are held by the Duchess Land Conservancy. So we originally worked with the town and a local friends group, to acquire this parcel of land where the Stone Church Brook and the Stone Church Cavern are located. And over time, the town has continued to acquire land to the south of here. And so a few, a few years ago, we actually added several trails that are up on the wooded hillside to the south of the Stone Church Cavern. So we're really, really excited to be here today and share the ecology and the history of the Stone Church Brook with you. Welcome to Stone Church. Follow me and we'll go to the trailhead. Oh look, there's a trillium and some trout lilies. Ooh, nice. Good find, Julie. So this is a trillium. Look at that, that's one of my very favorite spring wildflowers. It's called Trillium, you can see the first three letters are T-R-I, which means three. So pretty easy to spot this one. It's got three petals, three leaves on the plant. And often you'll find them in this kind of deep red purple color. There's also white trilliums. They come in a couple different colors. Beautiful. And what do you got next to you here? And down here, these are trout lilies, aren't they awesome? Oh, yeah. I love that yellow color in the springtime. So cool. So they're called trout lilies because the first thing that comes up is actually the leaves. The flowers come a little bit later. And you can see these leaves have this kind of speckled pattern, almost like the side of a trout uh -huh. with the scales on it. Cool. And the flowers are these beautiful nodding flower heads, six petals. Very and nice. this is one of our early spring wildflowers. What a find, and right next to each other. Yeah. Very cool. Hey, look at this. This is another one of my favorite spring wildflowers. This is called Dutchman's Breeches. So if you're not aware, breeches is another word for pants. And these look like little pairs of pants hanging on a clothesline. Yeah. I could not say for sure what kind of pants Dutch people wear. <laughs> But presumably they look kind of like this. <laughs> so these bloom in, in early spring yeah. and they have this wonderful feathery foliage that's also really distinctive. So you'll often find these growing in clumps and in, in wooded areas. Yeah, they're one of my favorites that, that come out pretty early in the spring when I'm walking in the woods. Always, always a nice kind of harbinger of spring. Yep. 
Yeah, and if you look for a while, you'll always, almost always find some pollinators buzzing around. Yeah, we've already seen a couple flies and, and bees yeah, and on them. Bees. Oh, yeah, bees. Yeah, very cool. Hey, check this out. There's a bunch of skunk cabbage down here. Yeah. So it's all around this area right by the stream. And what you're seeing right now is the leaves. But unlike a lot of things, the leaves actually come out later. If you were here in the early, early spring or even the late winter, you would have seen this, which is it's essentially the flower. So in the winter time, you'll see this kind of um, curved shape coming out of the ground. It's usually dark red. And it can actually grow right through the snow. This plant is capable of thermogenesis, which means it can raise its own temperature and allow it to, to push this um, flower part right through the snow. And it smells terrible. It's called skunk cabbage for a reason. But what it does is the smell attracts flies, which are its pollinators. Yeah, there's so, several flying around us right now. Yeah, so the flies get in here and pollinate it. They're attracted by the heat which this might be the warmest thing around in the winter time. So it's a really amazing plant. The skunk cabbage is one of the very first things that you'll see in the spring. And it loves these kind of wet places. We're right down by the stream right now. So this is perfect habitat for it. So one of the most common trees around Dover Stone Church is the Eastern Hemlock. And the section of woods we're in right now is almost entirely eastern hemlock. There's some birch mixed in as well, but um, largely hemlock. And eastern hemlock is a tree that prefers kind of cool, shadier habitats, typically along streams or near water. Um, it's one of my favorite trees personally. However, eastern hemlock is under threat from an invasive species called the hemlock woolly adelgid. And I think we have some over yeah, here, unfortunately. I if any of these trees have it. Yeah, I'm sure we do. Oh, yeah, look at that. So these little white spots are the egg masses, actually, of the adelgid. Mm -hmm. The adelgid, it's related to aphids. It has what we call piercing, sucking mouth parts. <laughs> and so what that means is that it will um, insert its stylet into the base of each needle and suck sap out of the tree. So what you see here are the egg masses. When they hatch out, they'll turn into little crawlers that if you have a magnifying glass, you'll be able to see them. But at the base of each needle, you'll see a tiny, tiny black dot. And that is the adelgid that is sucking sap out of the tree. So hemlocks are actually really resilient. They grow in these, on these rocky, steep hillsides where very few other trees are even capable of growing. So this stress of the adelgid on them and in a lot of cases proves fatal. But these ones are hanging on for now and hopefully they will continue to do so. And what's, what's one of the identifying characteristics of a hemlock? How could someone identify a hemlock out in, out in the woods? Well, a hemlock is an ever, evergreen tree, of course. So it has the green needles on it. And the needles are flat and come out of the twig on either side. So kind of opposite each other. Right. In a, so to make sort of a flattened twig. And the really key characteristic that you look for is on the underside. You'll see these kind of white stripes on the underside of yep. each needle. Yep. Got it. If I could find a clean branch, it would be <laughs> easier to see. But most of these have so much adelgid on yeah. them, it's really kind of hard to see. But yeah, they have that white stripe on the underside mm -hmm. of the, each individual needle. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Is that an egg mass? See that white blobby thing right there in the pond? Oh yeah. I think it's a salamander egg mass. Yeah. That was probably laid by a spotted salamander, which are actually really common, although most people have never seen one. They live underground, and for most of the year they're up in the woods living in their tunnels under the ground, but in the springtime when we have our first spring rainfall, they migrate to the pools to mate and lay eggs. Hmm. And so they lay these egg masses. The spotted salamander egg masses are often this white color, so they're pretty easy to look at. 
Um, sometimes they're clear, which makes them much more difficult to see, but there's one there. I think yeah. there's another one. Down oh, yeah, there. further down. Let's see if the camera can pick it up. Yeah, yeah, there it is. So they'll hatch out usually a month to six weeks or so, and the larvae will swim around in the pond, and then they'll emerge onto dry land sort of later on in yeah. the summer. And, and what salamander was that you said, Julie? It's called a spotted salamander. Oh, okay. They're pretty big, actually. They're about this long, including the tail. Wow. And they're big, kind of chunky body salamanders. These ones are black with bright yellow spots on them. Right, so right. They're really, really distinctive salamanders. But like I said, most people have never seen one, although they are quite common. They rely on these temporary pools called vernal pools or intermittent woodland pools to lay their eggs in. And most vernal pools dry up over the summer. And so that means there aren't fish in them. And fish are really big predators of these types of eggs of salamanders and frogs. So when there's no fish there, it means that they have a much greater chance that the eggs will survive into adulthood. So these kinds of habitats are really, really special and very important to protect. But it's also really important to remember it's not enough just to protect the pond. Because remember, they're only here for about a week in the springtime, and the rest of the year they're living in these woods. So you have to protect the woods around the vernal pool as well if you want to protect the populations of salamanders and wood frogs that use them for, for mating and laying eggs. So here we are at the edge of the Stone Church Brook, and we're in a really unique habitat type, which is called a cool ravine. It's not a great name for a habitat type. It's cool in both senses of the word, actually. It's literally cool because as soon as you walk into this place with these steep sides on it, this really deep ravine, the temperature drops quite a bit. And it's also cool because it's just cool. Look at all these great plants that are growing here. Some of this stuff is very rare in our area because they're more northern species that typically grow either further north or in the mountains, so they're adapted for a cooler climate. So as we walk up the stream, we'll probably encounter some of those plants and, that grow in, in colder areas. So you can see the ravine has these really, really steep sides. And so what that means is it doesn't get a lot of direct sunlight. You can see at this point, it's kind of midday right now, so the sun's pretty high up in the sky, but most of the ravine is still in deep, deep shade. So the air temperature is cooler, the water as it comes through the ravine is cooler, and so certain species just really need that cooler temperature, and they'll thrive in this kind of ravine, whereas they wouldn't really survive in other places. So this is a very, very rare habitat type, and it's really, really fun to explore. Some fiddleheads. Wow. Such a beautiful day to be here. What did you see? So it's tough to see here because he's a little far out and he's bouncing around, but we have in front of us here a Louisiana water thrush. Yeah, this is a really cool bird. It's a neotropical uh, migrant here to uh, the northeast. And he would have just gotten here in the last couple of weeks. They, they arrive to this area uh, in the first two weeks of April, typically. And uh, they overwinter in, uh, in, the, in the tropics, in Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean. And I can't find him anymore. I lost him. Useless here. Oh yeah, there he is. He's bouncing along the the, the riverbank there. Yep, right on the mossy rock. Yeah, there he is. And that's this is their perfect habitat. They love cool ravines like this. Um, and, and one of the identifying features. Oh, oh, there he is. Right, right on that nice rock there. I mean, probably tough to see, but yeah. He, what do they eat? Yeah, they'll they'll be kind of uh, hanging out by the stream right here, picking off aquatic insects. And they're they're kind of always bobbing their tail up and down. It's one yeah, of the, I, it's a really distinctive movement, isn't it? Yeah, and we'll show some. I have some photos. We'll show 
zoomed in on him so you can identify him better. But they're kind of brown and, and, and dark, kind of dark gray, streaky. Um, they are a warbler, so they're pretty small. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he'll be. This is this will be his home for a while. He loves. They love. Uh, they love this kind of cool, cool ravine area. Do you think it's built its nest already? Probably not. Um, it's tough to say. You know, again, they, they just got here recently, so he might still be looking for a mate. And uh, but it'll be it'll be any day now. Again, wasn't it? I hear it. We've heard a couple of them. There's at least two in here today. I've also heard winter wren, which is another bird that really likes nice, cool, kind of dark, shady areas like this as well. It's another really small bird. Dark brown. They, have, they always have their tail cocked up at almost like a 90 degree angle. They're residents. They'll, they'll winter here. They'll spend all year here and they'll spend green here as well. But a bird that really likes this kind of nature. Yeah. Well, you think a winter wren would like the cool ravine for sure. this. I think this is mountain maple. It's a little hard to tell because the leaves haven't fully expanded yet. Here's the one that's a little more out. So you can see it has that sort of three-lobed maple shape that we're used to with our sugar and red maples. But mountain maple has a much broader leaf and it's actually really similar to another common species in our area, striped maple. So the leaves of mountain maple and striped maple look almost exactly the same. They're very broad, kind of three-lobed leaf. But striped maples have really distinctive bright green and white stripes on the, on the bark. And mountain maple does not. So I'm guessing this is mountain maple. And that would actually make sense because we're in a cool ravine. So the mountain maple, as you can tell from its name, is generally a more northern species in the higher elevations. And so that would be the more likely candidate for what this is. And here's another little hemlock sapling. So you yeah. can see it's got those adelgid egg masses on it. Yeah. But this is really cool. It's growing right next to Canada U. So that's oh, yeah. what this is. Yeah. See how different that is? Yeah. So Canada U is a species that as you would tell by its name, likes a more northern climate. Mm -hmm. So you don't really see it growing around here. The yew hedges that you see are an introduced species that I believe is from Europe. And so this is American or Canada yew, which is indigenous to our area. But like I said, it mostly grows further north. But because we're in a cool ravine where the ambient temperature is quite a bit lower than the outside temperature, it actually thrives here. You can see it's all over this hillside. It's all covered with it all along here. Yeah. And, and the, the way you tell the difference. Yeah, I was just going to ask, Julie. They look kind of. The leaves look kind of they similar. They do. They do. So here, they look at them close together. Yeah. They do look really similar. So this is hemlock. Let's focus better. Here we go. Hemlock on the left, yep. and you on the right. So hemlock. Remember when you turn it upside down, has this white stripe pattern on the underside of each needle. Okay, right. And you can see the needles are kind of shorter as well. So the you has that same growth pattern where the needles are coming out of each side of the twig to make kind of a flat pattern. But you can see the needles are a bit longer mm. and underneath they're this beautiful green. So oh, no yeah. white stripes on that. But again, you won't really find Canada U growing in the wild in our area, except in these cool ravine habitats. Whereas right. hemlock is pretty common, right? Um, especially on these kind of rocky hillsides. It's a really resilient tree. It can grow in places where most other trees can't grow. So it's a, it's a pretty special plant to have. Hey, what's that? You know what plant this 
just... Oh, that looks really familiar. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that is. Yeah. Here, let's check it out on Seep. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, I really don't like cell phones, but I gotta admit, these apps are super handy for yeah. figuring out what stuff is. So, so let's see what it looks like. Yeah. So this is an app uh, you can download. It's called Seek. Um, it's a really cool tool. It allows you to take a photo of really any any kind of living thing. Um, you know, it's really most used for plants. But what you can do is you you click the, the photo button down here. And you hover it over what you're trying to identify, and in real time, it'll kind of once it focuses. There we go. It'll kind of whittle its way down and try to oh, find yeah. try to find what it is. There we go. Going right down to genus and species. Yeah. So what does it say? It, it's calling that uh, it, two two leaf. There it is. Two leaf toothwort. Toothwort. Yeah. Of course, that's what that is. That's why it looks so familiar. Yeah. And it's got the little flower head on it. It so does. Yeah. Come back in a week or so. Yeah. And there will be flowers on this plant. This is where you really feel that it's a cool ravine. It's really kind of chilly in here right now. But you can really see the difference in the, um, the biotic community. You can see all these mosses on these rocks. Look how damp these rocks are. So this is cool and damp, which is just what all these mosses and ferns are really loving. Yeah, look, oh, it's dripping down. It's actually dripping down, yeah. And if you look across, you can see the trees that we're looking at right here, these are all yellow birches, which is a native species that's pretty common in our area. It prefers this kind of cool, moist environment. So this is exactly the kind of place where you'll see yellow birches. They have this kind of um, flaky bark that peels off. standing here in front of the stone church cave itself and according to local legend back in the 1600s the Pequot chief Sassacus took refuge in this cave he was fleeing the British army um, his, his tribe had been routed by the British in Connecticut and they were fleeing from the British and they actually came here and took refuge in the cave for a while and you can see it, it would be a really great place to hide although kind of loud when the water's running really high so I can't imagine what that experience would have been like